Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce my uh, colleague and good friend, uh, Lisa Fairfax. Uh, Lisa is the Merrifield Research Professor of Law at, at GW uh, and a very treasured colleague of mine. She's also the Director of Conference Planning at Sealeaf and is a very valued and important colleague within our Sealeaf organization. Uh, she is a, a noted scholar uh, in the area of uh, corporate governance and fiduciary duties of directors. She teaches contracts, corporations, and securities regulation. Uh, she's also uh, uh, the co-chair co of a new initiative called uh, Direct Women, I'm sorry, Direct Women Board, which is a, a, an organization that is really working very hard to get more women on corporate boards of directors, and that's certainly uh, something we very much need to bring a different perspective into our uh, corporate management suite. Uh, so I will now ask uh, Lisa to please uh, uh, introduce our closing speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be here. I do, in fact, teach corporations, which I just ended early um, for uh, the delight of actually in being able to introduce uh, William Cohen, um, uh, who I, I do, in fact, follow on Twitter and, um, you know, read um, uh, in the variety of different news outlets that he produces. And I uh, am a huge fan um, because I think that um, you really give very eye-opening accounts of uh, what's happening, some very real-world perspective about what's going on and um, kind of a refreshing um, look uh, and most importantly, a comprehensive look uh, at some of the most important financial um, um, uh, issues, obviously, that we are tackling. Um, if you don't know, he's a former uh, Wall Street M&A investment banker um, at Lazard Frere, at Merrill Lynch and J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, he's also written um, three uh, nonfiction narratives, which um, I think are simply must-reads, uh, Money and Power, um, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World, House of Cards, A Tale of Hubris and Wretched Excess on Wall Street, and The Last Tycoons, The Secret History of Lazard Frere. Um, I think each of the books um, do exactly what I said um, he's known for doing, which is um, give a kind of brutally honest account of uh, Wall Street bankers and traders um, and the industry. Uh, in the case of Money and Power, the New York Times called it the definitive account uh, of Goldman and its rise. And, um, uh, the Last Tycoons was the winner of the 2007 Financial Times Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award. Um, and he's working on a new book, which I am very much looking forward to. All of my corporations and contracts students know I'm a huge sports fan, um, and he's combined that um, with issues related um, to financial in his um, next book, which is called The Price of Silence, The Duke Lacrosse Scandal, Wall Street, and the Power of the Elite, um, which is um, due to be published in the spring of 2014. So, um, and if any of his prior books are um, um, what we can go by, it um, promises to be captivating and revealing. Um, he's a contributing editor at a variety of different news outlets, um, but just yesterday, actually, he wrote a story in Bloomberg, which began with this intriguing first line. Uh, the most disappointing fact about how little things have changed on Wall Street five years after the collapse of Lehman Brothers is not that the Dodd-Frank Dodd Act is ineffective. In his view, he also says it's not about the lack of substantive regulations or the failure to hold Wall Street uh, executives accountable for failing to manage their enterprises. Um, and I'll leave it for him to tell us what is the most disappointing about um, um, five years later. So with that, I hope you will join me in welcoming William Cohen. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Art. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I noticed some people getting up and leaving. This would be a good time to do that. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to thank you for letting me speak here, and I'm inclined to do that, but you had me follow Elvis and then the Dream Team. <laughs> I need a morphine injection after what everyone said. I'm going to try to go forward here and uh, make my modest contribution if I can. Uh, so actually, thank you. This is really quite exceptional. Um, I have no business being here. 
uh, but I am, I am proud and honored that you asked me. Um, it is true, I am, I am frankly uh, infuriated uh, by the last five years. Uh, there was a moment, uh, as Dennis outlined in his uh, modest PowerPoint that you know, really touched on huge issues. Uh, there was a moment five years ago where people were really scared. Uh, and you know, they have an expression on Wall Street uh, where uh, when the lines of fear and greed cross, that's when you get action. Uh, there's no question the, f the fear uh, line was spiking, and of course, greed is always present. So uh, there's no question that there was a real opportunity. So uh, imagine my immense disappointment uh, when, I mean, I, I have to remind you all that I'm the person that wrote a column in the Washington Post that I thought Senator Warren would be more effective, excuse me, I thought Elizabeth Warren would be more effective inside Goldman Sachs than she would as a senator, and I encouraged her to get a job at Goldman Sachs where I'm sure they would hire her because it would be good PR. <laughs> she didn't listen to me, but I still believe she'd be more effective inside Goldman Sachs than as a senator. And I'm sorry, but that's the fact. Um, I'm very disappointed because I don't think Dodd-Frank is a good piece of legislation. I think it's a horrendous piece of legislation. As Senator Kaufman uh, said correctly, it was intentionally designed to be manipulated to the extreme by Wall Street interests. Who else has the patience or the interest? I mean, the rest of us are leading our lives of quiet desperation. <laughs> Who else has the interest to battle with the CFTC or the SEC or the Fed, any of these arcane issues. If you're being paid $1,000 an hour by Goldman Sachs, you have an interest, and you'll do it, and you'll do it to death. This becomes your, you know, your livelihood. You're making millions of dollars a year going through the minutia and the arcane details of these regulations that are still being drafted three years later we had an example, a very disappointing example, uh, uh, a month or so, two months ago now, time blurs, uh, with the regulation of derivatives, over-the-counter derivatives. There were supposed to be five bids, five bids, but the CFTC, again, Gary Gensler, I think, has done about as good a job as could be expected. There are other very noble people uh, at the CFTC, but you're supposed to have five bids and they end up with two. The reason, the reason that, as I wrote in my book about Bear Stearns, or at least the Bear Stearns people think that their, their hedge funds collapsed, the reason the AIG people think, believe me, and there's plenty of blame to go around, so uh, you know, everybody is culpable in some degree, but the reason that AIG believes that they got into serious trouble was because Goldman was making margin calls on their derivatives after they had purchased credit default swaps. And the reason that they could make those margin calls is because Goldman valued their version of these securities at 50 cents on the dollar, whereas AIG valued them at 100 cents. There's an amazing memo that came out of the whole AIG thing about, uh, I think it was in the, in the fall of 2007, where they looked at what all the different Wall Street firms said about the value of the very same securities. Well, Goldman was at 50 cents on the dollar, and Merrill had had issued a certain security, was at 95 cents, and Gold, of course Goldman was making all these collateral calls. What Goldman failed to tell anybody was, of course, they had the big short on beginning in December of 2006, so they stood to benefit immeasurably. There's somebody after my own heart who's leaving. Good, thank you. Uh, 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 they, they alone on Wall Street stood to benefit immeasurably because as of December of 2006, they had the big short on where they had shorted the mortgage market in every possible way they could have thought of. And then when they marked down the value of these securities in April 2007, the ramifications were instant. It immediately hit the value of the securities at the Bear Stearns hedge funds, which caused Bear Stearns hedge fund to fail and then led to a 
series of events that caused Bear Stearns to fail. And soon enough, they were making collateral calls on AIG. Now, again, if AIG hadn't insured the risk in the world stupidly, myopically, and taken huge fees to do it, made Joe Cassano a hundred, two hundred millionaire, such that they had to pay him a million dollars a month just to continue to defuse the bombs he had created, a lot of this wouldn't have happened. But, you know, there, there, there's so much that, that I could say. I mean, I think Dodd-Frank is a useless piece of legislation. Uh, uh, Glass-Steagall, which was much more effective, was 30 pages long. Uh, by the way, people overestimate, people like Senator Warren overestimate the power that, and the value that uh, Glass-Steagall played uh, in 1933. Yes, it was a simple 35 pages. It was elegant in its simplicity. Dodd-Frank is, what, 2,300 pages and counting? Uh, 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 you have to remember that in 1932, 1933, I think there were really only two firms that I can think of that actually were forced to make a decision. They were given a year by Glass-Steagall to decide whether they wanted to be investment banks or commercial banks, and only two banks actually had to avail themselves of this crucial, mind-boggling decision. Uh, one was J.P. Morgan, um, and uh, uh, the decision made there was to stay in commercial banking, so Mr. Morgan and Mr. Stanley walked across the street and created Morgan Stanley. Uh, the other one was uh, Bank of Boston, which also chose to stay in the commercial banking business, and which is why you had First Boston created. Uh, uh, you know, Goldman didn't have this decision. It was meaningless. Lazard, where I worked, didn't have this decision. It was meaningless. Completely useless piece of, I mean, it had no effect whatsoever. Uh, I want to get to why I think we've had so much stability uh, before uh, the repeal of, of Glass-Steagall. But, but first I want to just, and I will get to that uh, in, a, in a minute, but first I just want to continue my parade of horribles here, if you'll, if you'll, you'll, you'll let me. Uh, obviously, uh, the new regulations have not been written. They'll never be written. They'll never be written to do anything that will satisfy or be, protect Main Street, because Wall Street has got their horns in big time. There's been no prosecution. We've talked about that today. It is extremely irritating. It is ex a huge missed opportunity. If you don't hold people responsible for their bad behavior, what message is that send sending? It's sending that you can get away with bad behavior with impunity. You wouldn't do that with your children. I wouldn't have done that with my, when I was raising my two sons. We all have a responsibility to hold these people's feet to the fire, but it never happened. I want to talk about that. So, in no it's no surprise in my opinion that very little has changed in the last five years. We're no better off. I don't care what Senator Warren says. I don't care about Dodd-Frank. I don't care about these regulations being written. We have not changed people's behavior on Wall Street. The, co the column that I uh, wrote that was in the Bloomberg today was keyed off of an astounding article in the New York Times from a couple of weeks ago about life in the Hamptons and how it had returned to, you know, where, you, where you're talking about people willing to spend a million dollars to rent a house for the summer, a million dollars for a summer rental. That houses that are being sold for three to six million, I'm not talking about the hedge fund guys who can spend 25 or Stevie Cohen can spend 60 million on a house down the street from one he already has. They're at a very different price point. I'm talking about the Wall Street guys who are spending three to six million dollars on houses in the Hamptons. They can't keep them in stock. They're, they're blowing out. To me, September 2013 looks a lot like September 2006. Markets are booming, profits are high on Wall Street, people are getting paid bonuses just to do their jobs, which by the way, just to do their jobs, they're getting paid big bonuses, which are to take risks with other people's money. And this is at the heart of the problem that has not been solved. Now let me just talk for a minute about the incredibly disturbing New York Times article, I think earlier this week on Monday, about why there's been no prosecution. Uh, I, I shouldn't say this, but you know I can't help my, myself. Uh, I don't really know Ben Protis, uh, who writes a lot of these articles about the regulatory environment in Washington. 
somebody in Washington is doing a number on this guy. Uh, he cannot write enough apologies for what's gone on here, and I, I find it uh, appalling. What I mean by what's gone on here, I mean by the fact that there's been no prosecution. He wrote the defense of Kuzami Act. He wrote the defense uh, of, of Mary Shapiro Act. He's now done it again. Uh, he, you know, he's writing uh, the defense of Mr. Canellis Act. When Mr. Canellis says in early 2011, with regard to Lehman, we ran out of leads, that is appalling. As was mentioned before, the Volucas report, Repo 105, Bart McDade, one of the senior executives at Lehman, said he knows for a fact that Dick Fald knew what was Repo 105 was all about, and Mr. Canelo says that's the end of it. There's no evidence, and we care about justice. We have with us today, if he hasn't left, a, a real hero uh, whose name is Oliver Buddha, and I won't embarrass him by asking him to stand, but let me just tell you what Oliver did. This guy is a true American hero, and, he, and he's not alone. There are a number of people. I mean, Michael Lewis wrote in the big short, not to be confused with Goldman's big short, he wrote about you know, investors who saw the trouble coming and did something about it. Uh, of course, we all know about John Paulson, who made a fortune, $12 billion, from betting against the crisis. Goldman itself on the big short made $4 billion. But there are a number of people who worked at these firms uh, and I've just written a, a long Financial Times article about these people uh, who saw trouble coming at their firms, raised the red flag, tried to blow the whistle, tried to alert people, and of course, because this is America, <coughs> they got fired. Every one of them, every one of them got fired, and every one of them is sort of struggling uh, what to do now. Um, so. Uh, uh, Oliver was uh, in the general counsel's office, and if I get any of this wrong, I'm sure he'll, he'll correct me, but Oliver was in the general counsel's office uh, at Lehman for, for eight years. He, he worked at Skadden um, and uh, realized he wasn't going to make partner, needed a new job, uh, got hired by Lehman. He said, he told me that within a month, he knew that there was trouble at Lehman, just in the way Lehman was going about its public document disclosure. And in particular, he was able to tell immediately that the way Lehman was reporting the RSUs the awards, the restricted stock awards that Dick Fold was getting, was improperly disclosed. He knew in the end uh, uh, by the time he resigned in February of 06 on principle. Can you believe it? Somebody resigned on principle in February of 06. He knew that Fold had been given 15 restricted stock unit awards worth more than $400 million, but Lehman was only disclosing two of them valued at $146 million. That's a discrepancy of a mere quarter of a billion dollars for one man. He, uh, after he resigned on principle, Oliver spent two years traveling. He cared for a ailing aunt in Germany. He told me he wanted to get the stink, he wanted to get rid of the stink of working at Lehman by sort of disappearing off the face of the earth for a couple of years. Uh, I think he was in Vermont for a period of time. And he actually uh, was trying to put the whole Lehman thing behind him uh, when uh, the SEC changed some of the rules about the disclosure for the restricted stock units. Uh, and he was, went, as purely an intellectual exercise, went looking at the 2008 Lehman proxy just to see if Lehman was now going to comply. He tried. He, he, he tried many times over his eight-year stint there to get them to comply, and they wouldn't do it. He also found, by the way, that when uh, Lehman executives wanted to sell their stock during the middle of a corporate-level M&A transaction, uh, uh, 
the word went out that actually the transaction was over so that the, the Lehman executives could sell their stock. They sold their stock, and then a week later, guess what? The transaction was back on. He also, uh, during this time, discovered uh, a transaction where Lehman was trying to uh, 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 pass off its medical costs, uh, move it off balance sheet uh, for a tax deduction, a tax move that uh, the IRS uh, invalidated years later, but he knew was wrong, uh, uh, but the uh, accounting firm signed off on it. And interesting, he told me the story of how, at first, Simpson Thatcher, uh, Lehman's law firm uh, uh, was against the way uh, Lehman was portraying these uh, false restricted stock unit awards uh, and raised some issues with it. Perhaps it wasn't being done right. And one partner, uh, one managing director at, at Lehman said to Simpson Thatcher, we pay you $30 million a year and we don't have to keep doing that. So guess what? They got with the program. So Oliver is uh, going about his business, trying to get the stink of Lehman off of him, when he decides he's going to pick up the 2008 proxy and look and see whether, in fact, Lehman is now disclosing these RSUs properly. And he said it was purely an intellectual exercise, uh, but then he quickly discovered there was, quote, unquote, a bullshit paragraph in the proxy that hot hid quote, 90% of the awards. And he decided that obviously Lehman had not found religion, was still doing something terribly wrong. And he decided to go to the SEC himself, to blow the whistle, to be a whistleblower, to tell the SEC, he wasn't working on Wall Street anymore, he didn't have to do this. But he was so offended by what he saw continuing to happen that he contacted the SEC. What happened at the SEC, I asked Oliver. I think his words to me were, zip, zero, nada. Of course, when we know what happened to Lehman. Uh, when Dick Fold testified in front of Congress on October 6th, three weeks after the firm failed, he famously got into a shouting match or a dispute with uh, Representative Waxman about the amount of money that he actually made. There were charts. Uh, uh, Senator Waxman thought he made something like, correctly, uh, $530 million round numbers. Uh, uh, first, Dick said he'd only made $310 million. Uh, uh, then he amended it to say he'd made $350 million. Uh, but he never admitted what really uh, happened. So you can imagine uh, uh, Oliver's dismay, and, and mine, frankly, when uh, we, we read uh, Ben Protis's latest apology in the New York Times about why the SEC uh, uh, didn't uh, prosecute anybody. And uh, Oliver then uh, engaged in, the, he's writing a book about his experience at Lehman, which I'm sure will be fabulous. Uh, he. Uh, uh, then uh, wrote uh, in the New York Times in the comments section of this article uh, after he pointed out that uh, uh, there was a qu quarter billion dollar understatement uh, in, in Dick Fold's uh, take to Lehman Investors. Uh, he wrote uh, in his comments, uh, apparently that isn't material in the eyes of the SEC. And then he went on to say, which is of course the problem here, and I've written extensively about this, uh, uh, but it's the revolving door. And, and he, but he articulates it so well, I'll just quote him. During all the investigations and all the anguished deliberations of Shapiro, Kuzami, and Canellos, no one ever contacted me. That strikes me as odd, especially since I told them I had more to reveal if only they would ask. And then in parentheses, he mentions his duty of confidentiality to Lehman, which is very noble of him to still feel that way, uh, but also odd is Kuzami's failure to recuse himself on Lehman despite receiving his first job from Tom Russo, Lehman's chief legal officer, when Russo was a partner at Cadwallader, despite having worked alongside Joe Palazzato at Cadwallader, who was Russo's number two at Lehman, and who went on to take Kuzami's very job at Deutsche when Kuzami went to the SEC, and despite being a friend and golfing partner of Tom Hommel, Lehman's litigation head. 
Canelo's delivered big time. Watch him land on the private side at least as well as Shapiro and Kuzami have. Of course, we know Kuzami is now the $5 million man. Uh, this occasioned uh, additional comments after Oliver's comments, uh, one from Cody in Sheridan, Wyoming, who actually was a former SEC attorney. I'm sadly aware of how politicized the commissioners and their most senior staff have become and the depressing degree to which so much of the accumulated dead wood at the middle man management level of the SEC has blocked so many of the potentially dynamic contributions of its less tenured staff. Some commentators have decried the unsophisticated, quote, populist anger that mil militates for legal action against Fold and other Wall Street miscreants. Well, just because at least some of the so-called populist anger may be driven by emotion, class envy, undifferentiated resentment toward the more successful, et cetera, doesn't mean that two-bit thugs like Fold shouldn't be held responsible for their illegal and ultimately predatory activities. The public really understands. That's the thing. I mean, Nick. Verbitsky made the very good point in his question uh, before about a lack of imagination in terms of uh, thinking about how to prosecute these cases. Uh, I, I frankly think the whole crisis was a result of a lack of imagination. A lack of imagination on the people who worked on Wall Street to ever think that something like this could happen. They were so arrogant, so self-satisfied so uh, uh, taken with their own wonderfulness, and I know this after 17 years of working with these people, that they could not even imagine that, say, at Bear Stearns, uh, the, the market for short-term lending would move away from them, forcing them into bankruptcy. And it, and, it, and it cascaded down. I'm sure Joe Cassano never thought that in his decision to insure all the mortgage-backed securities in the world that anything like this would ever come to haunt him, back to haunt him. Uh, a, one, one more I just want to read here from this list uh, uh, of comments. A Paul Cohen, no relation, uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, wrote of Oliver's comments that uh, no one cont contacted you, Mr. Buddha, because the financial industry is one of the biggest investors in the federal government. Elections are so expensive that bags of cash are desperately needed to fund them, and which and to fund them which buys votes and protection. We no longer have a democracy of one person, one vote. We have a plutocracy. After all that has been revealed since the 2008 meltdown, virtually nothing of consequence has changed in how Wall Street operates. The provisions of Dodd-Frank have been dictated by Wall Street's army of lobbyists, four for every member of Congress. You have my utmost respect. Mr. Cohen, no relation to me, has it exactly correct. So. What do we do? What do we do? Well, I have my thoughts, and I'm going to share them. <laughs> this is my microphone <laughs> now. See, I spent 17 years on Wall Street. I know what makes Wall Street tick. That's perhaps what distinguishes me from everybody else you've heard from today. 17 years. I left it out there, OK? I know exactly the Wall Street mentality. You want to change Wall Street's behavior? You want to change what Wall Street does? Honestly, you don't need Glass-Steagall. You don't need Glass-Steagall for the 21st century. You don't really need Dodd-Frank. You don't need all the regulations that are, millions of man hours are being spent and, and hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent to, to uh, write what you need is you have to change the incentive system on Wall Street. You know, once upon a time on Wall Street, uh, Wall Street was a series of small, undercapitalized private partnerships where every person who worked at that firm and was a partner of that firm had his capital in the firm. That's where their capital came from, from the partners putting their money in. What's more? They had ultimate liability, not only for the capital that they put in, but for their entire net worth. So you had this situation where the partners at Goldman Sachs put their money into the firm. They got an extremely modest draw, and they had ultimate liability. So 
Senator Warren likes to point to Glass-Steagall as being you know, a definitive reason for why we've had stability in the financial markets for the last you know, 60 years before this repeal. The answer is yes, in part that, but much more importantly, the role of private partnerships. And that all began to change in the 1970s, when one firm after another, first with DLJ, which I write about in all of my books because it's a seminal moment, then with Merrill Lynch, then with Bear Stearns, then with Morgan Stanley, and then finally in 1999 with Goldman Sachs. If there is one single common denominator for all of the huge financial crises we've had in the last generation, it is because all of these firms went from being private partnerships where individual partners had their capital in and their liabilities up the wazoo so that everything that they made could be taken from them, including their Fifth Avenue apartments, their houses in the Hamptons, their art collections, everything could be taken to satisfy creditors in the case of a bankruptcy, to a situation now where everybody on Wall Street uses other people's money. They use other people's money for trading. They use other people's money for bonuses. They use other people's money to make loans. They use other people's money to underwrite. Everything is based on other people's money. That a sense of accountability that used to be so powerful and palpable in a Wall Street firm is gone forever. We've got to get it back. If we want to have any hope of solving this enigma, this, this, this Gordian knot of a problem that was laid out in spades here again and is clearly still a problem. It has nothing to do with regulation, I'm afraid. It has everything to do with the incentive and the self, mo the motivation of the people who work on Wall Street. Wall Street is an army. Wall Street is an army of individuals carrying out the orders of their generals, which was what was so appalling about the prosecution of Fab Torre. I have been a Wall Street vice president. I have been a Wall Street associate. I have been a Wall Street managing director. I've never been a Wall Street partner because by the time I got to Wall Street, there were no partnerships. I was at Lazard for a long time where there was a partnership, but I never made it to the partner ranks. I got cut out before that. But that's why, by the way, Lazard, nobody even talks about Lazard. No, Lazard never had to be bailed out. Lazard had a totally different business plan, which did not re re uh, utilize uh, money for trading. It used the partner's money, really Michelle Davivet's money, until they went public in, in 2006, to, to you know, provide M&A advice. One of the uh, uh, converts, the major league converts, to uh, you know, bringing back some form of Glass-Steagall, which, oh, by the way, I want to make clear, in case I haven't, that I do not agree with. One of the major converts was John Reed, who, of course, was one of the architects of the Citigroup Travelers merger, Citibank Travelers merger that created Citigroup. In a, uh, 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 the FT has done a great job this week of writing about the crisis, and uh, uh, it did an interview with uh, uh, John Reed. Now, John is, you know, he's been everywhere lately on this topic in the last few years. Even Sandy Weil has become now a convert to breaking up the big banks and, and some form of Glass-Steagall. But if you read, I'm going to read it to you. If you read what John Reed told the FT this week, he actually talks about the incentive system being the problem. It's the first time I've actually seen somebody at his level or former level actually addressing the real problem. This week, he talks about what happened when they merged you know, the investment banking culture at Solomon with the, you know, sort of more staid commercial banking culture at Citigroup. He said, when trading was small in proportion to everything, you could have a group of high bonus professionals that you treated differently and it didn't affect the culture of the whole organization. As trading becomes more important, then it becomes harder and harder to keep those cultures separated. And it began to work into the risk-taking culture as well. Risk officers would say to someone who wanted to make a loan, I don't like this credit. We aren't going to do it. Stop. Period. But now they would recognize that if a certain transaction didn't go through, his colleague wasn't going to be paid that year. It became very difficult to say, sorry, don't do it. Your colleague was being compensated for doing transactions. It became infectious. That's it. That's the problem. 
people on Wall Street do what they are rewarded to do. Like all of us, human beings are pretty simple. We do what, our reward, what they're rewarded to do. When I worked for 17 years on Wall Street, I was rewarded to give people M&A advice. So I did it. And I got paid millions of dollars to do that. I don't know why. I don't know why people paid me that, but they did. If your job is to put together mortgage-backed securities, guess what? You're going to put together mortgage-backed securities all day long, every day, every hour of every day. Well, we're sitting around here nice today talking about all these problems and what's gone wrong and how we fix it. People on Wall Street are doing what they're paid to do, which is take risks with other people's money. So what you have on Wall Street, and an interesting dynamic, is you have rewards given to financial innovation. So when Mike Milken created the junk bond market, one year when he was king of the junk bond market, he got paid $550 million. It was an extraordinary innovation. The junk bond market, now called Gentili, the high yield market, is huge, powerful, well-functioning, but in typical Wall Street fashion, when Milken introduced this, everybody else on Wall Street deconstructed what he'd done to try to figure out what he had done and how they could copy it and make money. And that led to huge excess in the late 80s when all of these big LBOs were being financed with junk bonds that should never have been put together and sold. And we had, that was one of the big contributors to the crash of 87. Another great innovator on Wall Street was a guy named Lou Ranieri at Solomon Brothers who had this great idea that mortgages and credit card receivables were nothing more than streams of cash and math and you could package them all up and sell them off as securities to everybody all over the world. You know, once upon a time when my father got his home in Worcester, Massachusetts, Dennis, $30,000 he paid for that house. And he borrowed the money from the bank and the bank kept that loan on its balance sheet for 30 years. So here's the relationship. Local bank, local guy, $30,000 loan, my father makes those payments every month, pays the principal off, everybody's happy, local bankers got an asset with real value. But what happens when a guy like Lou Ranieri comes along and says, you know, that's interesting, but that ties up your capital for 30 years. We'll buy that loan from you, we'll give you 98 cents on the dollar, you'll have 98 cents, we'll package all these loans up into securities and sell them off in investments all over the world. In part, it's called the democratization of capital. And he's absolutely right. It lowered mortgage rates for people all over the world, especially in the US. And that was a good thing, because it allowed people to afford their homes, theoretically. And that you know, met this idea of mortgage-backed securities, met the, uh, uh, the political idea that every, every president seems to fall in love with of, of home ownership, and how that's such an important fact of life, and we need to, as a big part of the American dream is to own your own home. Unfortunately, what happened is you took away the relationship between my father and his local banker. Now nobody knows the borrowers and the lenders. It's just a piece of paper. And, and uh, I forget who it was, maybe S Senator Kaufman says there's no limit to how many bad mortgages, or maybe it was Mr. Coffey, no limit to, excuse me, Mr. Galbraith. I knew I'd get it eventually. There's no limit to how many bad mortgages you could write. I mean, there is literally no limit. So why, you know, why were all these bad mortgages written and packaged up and sold? Because that's what Wall Street gets paid to do. And if you want to change people's behavior on Wall Street, you have to change what their rewards are. So, silly me. You know, about three years ago, I wrote an op-ed in the Times saying, make Wall Street, the headline was, I didn't write the headline, make Wall Street risk it all. And basically, the idea of the, of the piece was that you have to make, you know, you're not going to make Goldman Sachs. For a while there, a couple of years ago, people were talking about, oh, can we take, what if Goldman Sachs went private? Let's do that. Can, can we take more Goldman Sachs private and make it a private partnership again? You know, that's just like a $90 billion market cap company. You know, e e even for the Verizon uh, uh, a Vodafone a wireless deal, there's not enough capital to take Goldman Sachs private in a $90 billion uh, uh, deal. So that's, that's unrealistic. You're not going to make these big public companies into private partnerships again. So you have to create some sort of, forgive me, synthetic partnership 
uh, uh, way to make these guys who run these firms, the top 500 guys at these firms, the people who make the decisions on who to fire, who to hire, who to promote, what lines of business to be in, where capital is allocated, you know, how much people get paid, those guys, you know who they are. And mostly they are guys, I'm afraid. There should be a lot more women. We need to lower, frankly, the, 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 the alpha male behavior in this industry. And, and I, I wish it would happen, but it, it doesn't seem like it's destined to happen anytime soon. These top 500 guys at these firms, and Goldman, by the way, is a perfect place to do this because they have what are called partner MDs. They have these 400 guys at the top of that firm who get paid like nobody else on Wall Street. Instead of just getting a bonus based on revenues that they generate, the Goldman Partner MDs get paid out of the pre-tax income of the firm. You want to know why Goldman put on the big short in December 2006, when everybody else on Wall Street was still going great guns in the mortgage market? It's because the Partner MDs at Goldman Sachs got paid out of the pre-tax profits of the firm. And they were so busy protecting their $10 million a year annual incomes that they thought, oh my god, I see trouble coming. We better do something about it. And they did. And it was brilliant. And they were right. Of course, it didn't stop them from continuing to sell mortgage-backed securities until well into 2007. And it didn't stop them from telling the market they had done it. Or it didn't stop them from when they marked down those securities from telling the other uh, counterparties on Wall Street that they had done that and they alone stood to benefit from it. Nevertheless, it did save that firm. And the reason it saved the firm is because these guys who were running the firm were worried about whether they're going to get paid. Now, there's, now they no longer have the liability because they're still, they're still covered by the corporate shell now. But you need to get back. So what I proposed in the New York Times was that you create, you know, have some very smart lawyers, many of which are, are in this room, create a new security that would be tied to the full net worth of these top 500 guys at these firms. Every firm would have to issue this new security, the collateral for which was Fifth Avenue apartments, art collections, Hamptons houses, Westchester houses, G5s, whatever it is, everything, their entire net worth on the line. Once again, not everybody, it can't be done. But these top 500 guys who make all the decisions, that can be done, in my opinion. So the first thing that, that happens in a bankruptcy situation is that you know, these guys lose everything they have before the shareholders. One of the problems with Bear Stearns is well, people say, well, Jimmy Kane, he lost a billion dollars in his own stock. Well, that's true. He did. He'd also pulled out $400 million before that that he was just fine with. I asked him, Jimmy, what's it like to lose a billion dollars in your own stock? He said, didn't bother me. I got all the money I, I want and can use. It affects my heirs. So you need, we need to, and by the way, Jimmy was playing bridge, playing golf, and smoking pot when his firm was going down the tubes. He had no idea what was going on at Bear Stearns at the end, or even before the end. You need to make it in the interest, the financial interest of the people who run these firms, and I mean serious financial interest of the people who run these firms, to make sure that they change their behavior. Because once their butts are on the line for everything, you're going to see a major change in the compensation system on Wall Street. I wrote that piece three years ago. Only one Wall Street CEO called me, Lloyd Blankfein. And the reason Lloyd Blankfein called me is because he gets it. Number one, he gets that the rest of Wall Street doesn't understand risk. He's, in a, he's unfortunately in an industry surrounded by morons. And I give Lloyd a lot of credit. Lloyd said to me once, I spend 98% of my time worrying about things with 2% probability. Think about that. That's like, that's like close to genius kind of thing. I mean, Jimmy Kane was worrying about his bridge game and smoking pot. Lloyd Blankfein is worried about things with 2% probability. He's surrounded by idiots on Wall Street. So the problem, and he knows it. So he gets it. He knows that his 400 top guys are already kind of paid this way. They don't have that kind of liability. And notice they haven't done it. About six months ago, they called me down, which I took as some sort of victory because I know they didn't like my book. And uh, you know, it's funny that 
Uh, Lisa mentioned in the introduction that the New York Times said nice things about my Goldman book. Actually, Janet Maslin trashed it, which I'll never forget. Uh, and uh, of course, what writer forgets what a reviewer uh, says. Uh, uh, but it was clear that she hadn't read it, uh, which is most what the most distressing thing is. But um, Lloyd, Lloyd got what I wrote. But he called me down about six months ago, and he said, you know, uh, uh, some of his guys said, what should we be doing? And I reiterated again this idea. If you want to be a real leader on Wall Street, this is the moment. This is the time. There are no leaders on Wall Street. There's, there's a bunch of sheep. They're meek. They're, 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 they're down. I mean, they're not down financially, but they, they are so out of favor that there's no leadership. You know, the latest king of Wall Street, Jamie Dimon, is a pathetic excuse for a leader. So Lloyd had this real opportunity, in my opinion, to be a leader. And the way to be a leader was to voluntarily implement this change in the compensation system. Well, obviously that hasn't happened. So I'm still here. I'm still talking about it. But I did notice, and then I'll shut up and take your questions. I did notice, you know, I mean, what their timing on this was very strange, but uh, in the end, at the end of August, uh, a, a group of, of three intelligent individuals, including a uh, former Goldman Sachs trader, uh, Jacob Goldfield, who I wrote about in, in my Goldman book, who is quite an amazing guy, actually. He, he um, uh, uh, dropped out of Harvard Law School to work at Goldman. He, he was the guy who introduced Larry Summers to Bob Rubin which I should hold him accountable for for the rest of his life, uh, uh, which unfortunately we're all suffering from. But in, in late August, he and a couple of uh, professors came up with an idea called equity recourse notes. And this was written about in the FT uh, recently. And basically the idea is that every bank, and I, I, I apologize to him if I get it wrong, but you can, you can read about it. Uh, every, every financial institution would be required to, instead of issuing debt, would be issuing equity recourse notes. So that any time the firm you know, started to get into trouble, which he defined as the stock price falling 75%, instead of issuing you know, interest payments on this debt, you would, inter you would uh, issue equity to the bondholders. So basically, if the firms got into trouble, you would sort of have this self-liquefying debt instrument, and they could really never technically go bankrupt because you would essentially dilute all the existing shareholders by issuing new equity, and, and you would recapitalize these firms. It's a very interesting idea. I said to him the other day, well, if you could marry that with my idea, we could really have something. So that's my new uh, uh, crusade is marrying this idea of the equity recourse notes with uh, a real change in the incentive system on Wall Street. Look, this could be considered a very, very depressing day, and I, and I get that. I'm, I'm like catatonic at this point. Uh, but you know, one thing I learned in my 17 years on Wall Street is that uh, you cannot have capitalism without capital. You know, the whole world now has adopted capitalism, whether we like it or not, okay? At the moment, it's the winning philosophy. It's the winning economic construct. So the, the left ventricle of capitalism is Wall Street. That's where it all happens. You know, like it or not, and believe me, I don't like much about it. I mean, what other industry on the face of the earth has no cost of goods sold? Wall Street, or especially the big banks, like J.P. Morgan Chase with $2 trillion in assets, $2 trillion of our bank deposits, our checking accounts, our savings accounts. Have you looked at your interest rate on your savings account recently or your, your checking account? It's .0000 something. So we are giving them our money for free. And they are using that money, our money, that we're giving them for free. I think we need to have our head examined. We're giving it to them for free, and they are using that money, and, and, and that is the raw material for how they make money, whether it's taking money to, the, to, to buy treasury securities, to get an immediate 3 or 4% yield, to, to making loans, whatever it is. They are using our raw material that costs them nothing to get money, to make money. 
No wonder they're so profitable. No wonder, no wonder J.P. Morgan is on track to make $23 billion this year. The point is we've got to get this right. We've got to fix it. And you know, conferences like this are hugely important in making that happen. So thank you for listening to me, and I hope you're all handling it okay. Thanks, Bill. You know, I was waiting for the turn to the optimism, and, um, uh, but and we actually don't have time, as you know, for questions and answers. I do want to say, though, in uh, conclusion, uh, before Art has something to say for a moment, but, um, you know, we all have uh, the best democracy uh, that we give ourselves. And it really does require, it gets back to a couple of questions, people participating. And Elizabeth Warren may be wrong about a number of things. The regulators may be wrong about a number of things. Uh, frankly, I'm sure we're wrong about a number of things. And we don't have to all agree. I, I tell people I don't even agree with myself 100% of the time. Um, and skepticism is healthy and criticism is healthy. But being engaged in the process, whether it's on eminent domain or whether it's litigation or whether it's just advocating for or against Larry Summers or Janet Yellen or whatever, people need to get in the game. Too many people are leaving the game of democracy, which is more important, more fundamental. And at the end of the day, uh, the point of looking back at something terrible that happened to our country and the response to it and how it still impacts literally every single family and person in America. The point of it isn't to disengage or be discouraged. The point is to be engaged and change the terms under which in any way that you can engage, change the terms under which that's all playing out. And whether it's the idea on equity linked notes or whether it's figuring out how to get these 500 their skin in the game, meaning literally their skin, um, or whether it's uh, any number of ideas that you can hear from Ted Kaufman or John Coffey or uh, the rest of them or, or Senator Elizabeth Warren or her colleagues, um, that's the important point. And the problem is in politics, bad drives out good. And you can't let the good get out because the bad takes over. It's the same thing on Wall Street. There, and you're right, I mean, there are no leaders on Wall Street. There are a bunch of sheep all chasing a big dollar at the expense of everybody else. We are the everybody else. So um, the only thing I would say is there's a lot of things you can think about that could be better, could be done right, aren't being done well. Um, but to the extent uh, you've got a criticism about it, you, need, you have a duty to get in the game and make it change one way or the other. So, and I think that if you listen to the speakers and you read what they've got to say, there's all sorts of avenues to uh, get engaged and do the right, help do the right thing and help people get the right way. Um, one uh, personal better markets note I wanted to make is Mike Masters is here somewhere in the audience. Um, you know, you want to talk about getting engaged. Mike Masters uh, is the funder and founder of Better Markets and had the idea of Better Markets because in 2008, uh, 9, and 10, he saw what was going on. And um, he's a, a philanthropic uh, a person who believes in democracy and he believes in markets that work for everybody. And he wanted to write a check for a contribution to an organization that promoted the public, uh, the public interest in the financial markets. And he looked around and he couldn't find one. He didn't go home and say, well, I need a, what was it, a G7? What is the car? I don't know what it is, but you know, he didn't need a car, didn't need a house, didn't need this. He said, well, if there isn't one, I have an idea, I'll create one. And that's what Mike Masters did. He's the chairman of our board. Um, now, he could have gone back to the comfortable living in the home and everything and say, you know what, that is a cesspool, things are going to hell in a handbasket, I got nobody I can even write a check to. Um, but that's not what he did. And that's, now, that's a different scale of idea of a lot of people. On the other hand, uh, we too are only limited by our imagination and commitment. And we all uh, should stand up, get engaged, and do whatever we can in any arena or capacity uh, that we can. So that's the end of mine. Art, do you want to uh, close for us? Thank you all for coming. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. Uh, thanks to our audience for coming. Uh, I would just echo what Dennis said. I think we have to take very seriously uh, what has happened in this country. Uh, it, it is our duty as citizens, I think, to analyze and, and understand uh, these important events that have shaken our system to the roots. I think it's also encouraging to look at each of our speakers. I encourage you to review their bios, visit their websites, Read, read their publications, each of them in different ways has chosen to take action, to take a position, to move opinion in this country. Uh, each of us 
I think here today has that ability. We can take action. We can we can let our voices be heard. We have each different gifts and different ways of doing that. But I, I echo Dennis's point. Don't don't be cynical. Uh, don't give up. Uh, the, the only way to, to, to make change is for yourself to get involved. Uh, find other people who share your views. Uh, and uh, I, I, I believe the truth uh, does prevail in the end, but the truth has to be heard and has to be voiced. Thank you very much. Uh, we hope you enjoy the day, and uh, we hope to see you at future events.